hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to Penet to Three, the fortnightly program uh, where we talk to writers and editors from India and beyond, uh, writing in multiple languages. Uh, we were a physical presence before the pandemic, and now we are fully and probably permanently online. Uh, and today, it's my very great pleasure to welcome uh, Sukrita Paul Kumar and Vinita Agrawal. Uh, both eminent poets, critics, and uh, Sukrita is also an academic. But uh, today we are speaking to them more in their capacity as the editors of the Yearbook of Indian Poetry in English, 2021. I hope I got the name right. That's right. And uh, we are going to be talking about the book, reading from the book, and we are also going to be playing videos uh, by poets uh, who have poems in the book. Full disclaimer: I'm one of those poets, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but but what is really uh, which brings me to the straight to the point, which is uh, that the Indian that the yearbook is not it is subjective as all selections are, but it is also in a sense it makes a very strong uh, credibility claim because it was actually the result of not only the editorial interventions of Suprita and Virita, but also it went through a rigorous selection process by a panel of. Uh, poets and publishers. If I'm if I'm correct, That's uh, right. so uh, you know, and that is exactly how you can you know uh, that is exactly how you say yes. This is an yearbook, in the in the proper sense of the term. Uh, would you would you guys like to uh, tell us a little bit about this before we get into the uh, conception of the yearbook about the panel and about uh, how you two came together, how the panel came together, how the idea came together. Well, I, um, I think, thank, first of all, thank you very much uh, to you, to Prithvi for organizing this for us, because I think we are always looking for a platform to disseminate the idea of the yearbook, because the yearbook, I think there's a lot of effort, yes, of course, went, that went into it, into the concept, of course, and also into the doing of it, because we were trying to basically uh, bring in both inspiration and perspiration into it because yes, it was a very inspirational kind of a coming together between um, Vinita and myself, not at all planned because these days in any case, whatever you plan never functions, right? Never happens. So we this, this, this was really truly uh, just a kind of a random um, kind of talking that happened and then the idea emerged. And the idea was more than random, of course, because it had to be fleshed out in a very rigorous way. And, uh, but we did it with a lot of joy, spirit of joy, spirit of energy, a lot of energy into it. And I don't think we were, and also fortunately, I think we, we saw eye to eye in most uh, cases. Yeah. And um, even when there was a little bit of a difference, it didn't look like a difference because basically the concept we were coming together on that. And uh, also we the, one of the points that we were very, very keen on was that it should be as objective as possible, the selection. And we know, and as you know, that uh, social media and uh, publication of some magazines, not too many, but there is a mushroom growth of poets all around and poetry so much that it's very difficult to really have a discerning eye as to what to uh, keep in the mind and not what to kind of, how do you sift good poetry from non-poetry? I don't even want to say bad poetry, but just non-poetry, you know, but there is so much of it all around. And we thought that it would be a good it's high time in, in as far as Indian writing in English is concerned and particularly poetry. It's high time that we get together some of us who are in, into the business of poetry, writing, reading, editing, anthologizing, and we've been there for decades. So I think it's our responsibility. It's almost like a social responsibility, you know, that we uh, conduct um, this kind of a program where we come together on sifting as, as to begin with, this was the objective to do the sifting, you know, and, and not just, it cannot be an all time sifting because obviously it's an ongoing process that is happening. In, and as far as writing is concerned, more and more every year is happening. So it better, we thought it would be better to do it as a yearbook so that um, you know, we capture creativity and the creative vigor and rigor that you see all around in poetry. We capture it for the year and uh, kind of see how it's dynamic 
from year to year, it might change, it might, you know, remain the same, whatever, whatever, but record keeping is the thing. And maybe Vinita, you can add on to this. Yes, I would like to actually, first of all, tell you a very thrilling, uh, you know, backstory to the yearbook. The fact is that it was conceived in Bombay itself. So Suprita was here to read for Kala Ghoda 2020. And uh, we were together at this afternoon and just sitting and chatting about, uh, you know, the plethora of Indian writers writing in English all over the world, the Indian diaspora included. So we thought, how do we, how do we make sense of all this beautiful work, this remarkable crafting of poems that Indians are you know, doing? So we need to put it all together in one book, hopefully. And then we were talking about how would we do it? What would we call it? And then we just thought we should call it the Yearbook of Indian Poetry in English. That's how, it, that's how the seed was, uh, was actually planted in the soil, so to speak. And then we had this committee of eight very eminent, very accomplished, most respected poets. And they were, uh, they were the review committee who looked at the long list that we gave them. So we gave them about 200 poems out of which we requested them to, um, to, to select almost approximately 100 thereabouts. And our submission had gone up to almost 600, 650 poems. So we long listed it and then we gave it to the review committee. And the review committee cons consisted of uh, very eminent poets like uh, K. Sri Lata, Ranjit Hoskote, Ashwini Kumar, E. V. Ramakrishnan, Menka Shivdasani, and Anjali Purohit. And Anjali, we're very grateful to her also because she was the one who coordinated amongst the committee members and gave us their shortlist, you know, whenever at the due date or whatever, whatever the deadline was. So it was as objective as we could make it. But yes, like you said, selection is always a subjective process, but we are not apologetic about it at all. And we love the yearbook as it's come out and we love the way that new poets and new names have been thrown up in the yearbook. And that's a very fascinating thing because uh, the wonderful thing about subjectivity is that it is probably the best exercise of taste and there's no better, uh, uh, arbiter or whatever, dip yardstick to art than taste. Uh, so you, you said uh, a lot of young poets, a lot of uh, hitherto uh, less platformed voices have now you know, found mention in the yearbook, their poems and the yearbook. Yes. Uh, can you tell us a little about the application? Like, did you, did you invite applications? Did, did you have a, uh, an open call for submissions? How, how did that work? It was an open call. Yes, yeah. yes, Sukritan. You know, I just want to also, you know, add on a little bit to what we were talking about in terms of the process. One point which is very crucial uh, is that all the reviewing happened blind. Oh, yes. It was blind review. So, you know, to us, it was very important not to think of the poet as much as the poem. And that I think we were able to very successfully, Benita. It was a miracle yes. the way it happened. Absolutely it blind review. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, uh, but also, of course, and mind you, it just it wasn't just one round of selection, because we wanted to make sure what left over was again sent to the uh, um, committee, and we also scanned it all over again just to see that you know we are as fair as possible. But of course, there is always some maybe some very good points got left over. Maybe it's not representative. We can't help it. No, no book is going to be really representative. Absolutely. Also, because, also, the point is that not everybody submitted, but yeah. what you expect that not everybody got published in that year also. And, uh, and even those who did get published, maybe they didn't come across the, you know, call for yeah. submission. And to answer it was that, an so open call, Surit. Mm -hmm. It was an open call. It was on the social media. Right. And, and you know what, if there's anything that we would that we regret, it's the fact that it's limited only to the social media, because there are some senior poets who are not on the social media and they don't have uh, information about things that are announced on the social media. But unfortunately yeah. we have our limitations and there's no way, and we did not want to write to each and everybody and call out for poems and ask, because you know, then you would leave out something or the other. And then yeah. that, would be a, that would be another set of problems. Absolutely. So we just made it an open call. Yeah. Absolutely. And, however, and that's, however, yeah. 
first this idea of you know writing to the editors of different magazines uh, and you know ask them to contribute uh, the so nominations they, uh, they could give nominations which is also what happened right. last, yeah. and that's fabulous because uh, then then you make sure that you get as wide a range of uh, material as possible uh, can you give us uh, an idea of the time frame involved it must it, it's, it's, it sounds like a very prodigious pro, uh, big project how, how long did it take from say you know open call to okay now send it to the <laughs> send it to the publisher to print so that happened the open call went out in the month of um, i think it was october yeah and we gave the manuscript was given to the publishers in the month of maybe may so about 6 months Six, six to seven months, it was there in the pipeline, and that's what it took. That's fabulous, <laughs> and uh, and what I find especially remarkable in all this, uh, and and that is true of many many nearly all uh, Indian poet in English, is that this was totally a voluntary project. You uh, you uh, the the selection committee, yes. the contributing poets, all all volunteers. So it's staggering how much of this. Uh, how much of culture is really created through these voluntary efforts it's uh, so congratulations lovely. once again yes, very, very well pointed out to me because you see uh, i think we must point this out as well that not a single person refused you know i mean when we decided to make a committee and call out people you know for a voluntary work um, not a single person said I can't do it for this reason or that and everybody is a busy person so that is the beauty of it right from the committee onwards to uh, even the publisher the first publisher we talked to he was all game for it so yes. i think we have been quite lucky because you often hear this isn't it from everywhere that poetry doesn't very easily get published and so on so this was a really very very welcome venture and it became a labor of love total volunteerism and um, uh, you know with a lot of love and a lot of obviously effort mm. so and also we... passion passion for that work mm. absolutely yeah. absolutely to sustain it over 6 months uh, at varying uh, pace it, it's it's mm. quite it's 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 prodigious uh, uh, so before we move to uh, the publisher um, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the panelists the the judges uh, just the names i'm sure that Uh, the people who will watch this will know them already in some way or the other yes everybody in india who writes in english knows about them and um, uh, the names i will share with you but our objective in drawing out the names these names was that we wanted somebody from all corners of india we didn't want all the poets of the review committee to be either from bombay or delhi or the south so we had shri lata from the south we had ranjit from bombay we had um, Ashwini, Ashwini is like a—he's like an Indian, you know. You can't call him a North Indian anymore. Well, he was there. So, so K. Shri Lata, Ranjit Muskote, Ashwini Kumar. Then, then we had Menka Shivdasani. We had Anjali Purohit, who was very kind to coordinate also amongst the review committee. We had E. V. Ramakrishnan, and uh, we had Devijyoti Sharma, who is from the east of Red River. The yes, of Red River. Yes. The, the one man uh, boutique publisher, indie publisher, Red River. Yes, indeed, absolutely. Yes. Although we we called upon him as a poet, he is yeah. also a poet. Of course, of course, I, I absolutely. Not in his capacity as a publisher. Absolutely, absolutely, and uh, and uh, and a very yeah, worthy and, and Uttaran, good poet. Yes, absolutely. And we had Uttaran Das Gupta, who is also from the east. Yes. So that was the eclectic mix that we sort of ruffled up. <laughs> fabulous, fabulous, and and the publisher. Uh, you said that the first publisher you approached was Game. Uh, yes. Can you tell us a little bit about the publisher before we move on to uh, metaphorically opening the book and reading? Sure, sure. Yeah. So, so who 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 was the who is the publisher and uh, how how did that process go? It was a kind of uh, hawa kar, uh, the publishers. and uh, bitan and uh, kiriti sen gupta they are the ones who uh, we approached and uh, as as we said you know i mean we just came up with the idea and there was absolutely no i would say interference 
or any kind of condition laid out, you know. That is and, their speciality, uh, uh, absolutely. Yes. yes, and that is something which is really wonderful, whether it is to do with the size of the book, number of poems, pages, this, that, not a single negative point, you know. Whatever we decided, whatever Vinita and I not only decided, we decided on the basis of what was recommended to us and what kind of solutions we had. Mm. And we all didn't have any idea as to how many pages we were going to make in this poem, uh, in this book. And so that way, I think the publisher's role was uh, to publish hmm. and have faith in us. That's the <coughs> yes. Excuse me. total hmm. commitment and faith. And, and living up to the deadlines, you know. Uh, and that is also not easy for a publisher to do because we know whether it's Savakal or, uh, you know, people who are doing only poetry, how much of a queue there is. There are so many people who, who are submitting their manuscripts, you know. But I think there was a little bit of a priority given to this book as an anthology, which I think even to the publisher mattered. And of course, there was an element of risk in it. We know that. And so the publisher was also probably conscious of it and managed to take the risk with us because you know, anthologization can always mean making, yes, a lot of friends, but a lot of enemies also. <laughs> we know that. You know? Absolutely. So, so, um, so we didn't want to be our own enemies as well, you know. So that is why we thought that let it be a larger group and the publisher was part of it in that sense. But the publisher, this particular publisher, we deliberately decided, let him not be in the committee. Mm -hmm. So he himself is a poet. And right. we value that. We value that matter a lot. And that is why probably uh, these books are happening. But we just decided to keep, it, keep the publisher a little out so that even there, there is no bias of any kind that uh, comes through, you know. So, And I would like to add that... Uh, if, if at all the publishers gave us any inputs during the, you know, the last few days when the print run is just about to go to the press. So at that time, their inputs were extremely helpful and extremely positive and, and very, very, some of them were critical inputs that we mm -hmm. got from, especially Kiriti Sengupta. And the second thing is now the book has also gone into a reprint. So, oh, fabulous. Congratulations. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Fabulous, fabulous. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so now we come to the book. Um, uh, and we could probably begin with the readings. Uh, but again, if you if I just sort of, uh, you know, asked you, uh, just for curiosity's sake that now, you know, now, now you, there has been a bit of a distance between you and the first year book. You know, there's some time has passed, some water has flowed under the bridge. So if you just read it again, if you just leave through it, not as the co-editors, but as poets yourself, do you, do you see anything? Do you see a snapshot of something there? Do you see any patterns? Do you see anything that leaps out at you? The yeah, pandemic sure. leaps out to me. Hmm. Sorry? The pandemic. The pandemic. The pandemic and poems, poems and solitude and, and the even migration that happened during, you know, post, as soon as COVID had struck in March last year. That and, I feel that the yearbook kind of is, you know, it resonates with the time. It's, it's definitely a reflection of what the year meant to those poets. So, Krita, would you like to add to that? Yeah, yeah. So, I, I, I feel, yes, it's very, very important to see how, you know, even in poetry, a certain kind of sociology and history gets, uh, they get inscribed into poems, right? So, obviously, we are talking about the yearbook in a particular year, of which is such happened to be pandemic and so on. So, it was, it was, it is getting reflected in a very big way, sometimes in a very philosophic way, sometimes, you know, in a descriptive style, a narrative style and so on. But um, also, I would like to emphasize on the fact that there is a lot of diversity out here. See, regional diversity, you say, you know, even linguistic, uh, the, the influence of mother tongue, as we know, you know, with the, the tongue that is used all around, how that interacts with the English that is getting used. So there are many Englishes that you see here, and it's not just Englishes, but also uh, language, of course, is diverse, but uh, 
also content becomes diverse, the approach becomes diverse, and the forms, I mean, depending on what kind of uh, uh, content there is, the form is modulated, moderated accordingly. So there is a lot of diversity, and this is something that we were very keen on achieving, you know, so that the book doesn't become, I mean, you, you, there is, I mean, we, we know that there's a heterogeneity of cultures in the country. And this heterogeneity is usually, you know, when you say also when this is a book in English, usually people think of it as a very, in a very um, homo style, you know, homogeneous uh, cultural input and uh, would be what they would be expecting. But uh, English, uh, you know, is kind of used all over, all around. Mm. But these, this is not just English, but it, it's English is as we have been saying. And in our introduction, we emphasize on that. And that is why we and, uh, very emphatically say this, because uh, this diversity cannot be missed out, even if it is the approach to pandemic, which everybody is suffering. And there are some common themes in that, you know, whether it's loneliness, this, that, whatever, disease, migration. But even there, there are regional differences. But, and also, it's, that's not the only theme that is covered here. Mm. There are many other themes that are taken up. So uh, you do see a lot of diversity. And also you see diversity in terms of age groups, you know, of people who, poets who have written. There are very young poets, there are new poets, there are, there are the senior poets, you know. So there is a good, I think a good mix of, uh, uh, you know, different age groups, uh, age groups that we see in this yearbook. And that's to- There's, there's hmm. one more thing I would like to add, Sukrita, when you were talking about English is, so, Suhit, we had this conversation with Sampurna Chatterjee, and I'm being a little premature in, in de revealing the content because it's not yet been uploaded on YouTube. But she described this strange, uh, what is the term that she used, Suprita? Strange conspiracy? No. Some strange, no, discomfort, I think it was. Strange yeah. discomfort with yeah. English. Mm -hmm. you yeah. Know? That, that kind of, uh, to perceptive editors and poets and readers, mm -hmm. that has come through. In, in the yearbook that, you know, what is the strange discomfort that a particular poet has with English, the way he or she uses it. And Sampuna pointed at that, that out and I, I completely agree with her because in the use of language, we do see uh, how comfortable the poet is writing in that language. That, that well, strange so, sense, not yeah. everyone is very comfortable. Yeah. You know? so, yeah. So yeah. when you read between the lines, you get to know of that slight distance that the poet has. Absolutely, and, and that really is. hits that really hits home for me particularly, mm -hmm. um, uh, because uh, you know uh, I don't know I don't know some I, I read no, but somewhere. I have to say I I've told you that, and I can say this right here on this platform. Your poem is one of my favorites in the book. Yeah, not because yeah. it's Maybe on climate change. change. Yeah, that hummingbird poem, but it's mm -hmm. it's, it's beautifully conceived. Absolutely. Also, I feel that you know there are um, uh, uh, that you also see how the interlinking is there. You know, these themes are connected. You think of climate change, you think of pandemic, you think so. You know, one can write a whole story about the times looking at the poems out here. But mm -hmm. also back to that point about you know discomfort with the English if you look at the dynamics of it all you know I mean the wrenching away that happened from say Raja Rao said this long ago he talked about it uh, in the you know beginning itself of Indian writing in English when he was saying that okay we have to um, uh, we, we are writing in English we may write like the but we should not write like the English you know yes. we have to discover our own identities there and that process has taken its time in the whole process of you know decolonization this that because even after the freedom it's not as if we immediately broke out of that mold it has taken so much time and the discomfort continues to some extent, but there are also now you see free flights of imagination, you know, uh, and getting articulated in, in freedom with which the language is getting used, the English language is getting used. So you can see that trajectory, you know, you can see that, you can have a whole conversation about that. It, it can be a very academically viable kind of a discussion to see what is the post-colonial uh, kind of uh, uh, reflection, you know, how do you see that in terms of content? Because, you know, people, there was a time that the convent bred English medium 
child as it were you know was think big we began to tend to think in those terms that this topic is not for me only because the language was not able or that content was not getting access to that language right mm -hmm. so those those things were either exoticized and we know there's a lot of, lot of debate about that writing in english in the context of exoticization of content because you choose from the point of your presentation to the tourist as it were right if to who's going to read english so mm -hmm. you don't see that anymore now you see that there is a perfect owning of language in many cases and so there is a confident uh, very confident fiddling with english language you can use it the way you want to right so that liberation is i think a pure point a wow point out, out there and and in fact you know poems by the diaspora of poets who live in the united states they have been uh, using indian hindi words in uh, english poems like you have uh, Shikha Saklani Malviya when she was when she talks about the jamun tree, and Kashiana Singh in in her Pagri poem. So it's it's been uh, it's been a revelation the way Indians use English. That's fabulous to know, and uh, it's such uh, it's such cheerful news <laughs> that uh, uh, that in fact this provides a perfect opportunity to play the first video. So uh, Sukrita and Vinita have very kindly. Uh, procured three videos from three poets whose work appears in the yearbook: Soni Somrajan, Shobhna Kumar, Arjun Rajendran. Uh, and Vinita, I believe you want to play Soni's video first. Yes, I would. Let me try my best to do this successfully. Let me just try. Uh, so I would, I would be really, uh, you know, it would be very interesting if we uh, played them in succession. Okay, all right. And, uh, no and then we can uh, have a few more questions, and then we'll uh, uh, we'll segue into more readings. Uh, okay. So, so all you right. can you can do it the classic way. You can read out poems of yeah. your uh, poems of your choice. And there you go, okay. Vinita. We can see your screen. All right. Can you hear? Yes, absolutely. And uh, yeah, it's it's loading. So. I think the volume is not uh, the volume is a bit muffled, a bit low. I see. The day communism died. Now is it better? Slightly, the rather better. Themselves. I can't hear. We don't cry, mother. We are the simplest of cotton in the thinnest air, and depend on money for it. The family and anyone who can't discuss the eyes and days of a cremation. As grandfather's body lay beside a flickering lamp, never did while he was filled to its seams, the broom holds its breath, unable to out the one who built it. The period such hush, broken also by a sudden wail, sometimes is a cat. In death, this free for all manifests. Betrayal of the departed, conquered fate, preserved carefully once, now undone. The public washes away the private, rendering everything. <coughs> so, should I play the second video? Uh, Vinita, I think uh, you know. Uh, I would. I'll play it from my end. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so, so if you if you could. Uh, Stop screen sharing, then I'll okay. load the second one. All right. Thank and you. there we go. Uh, so the second uh, video I'll be playing is by uh, Shobhna Kumar. Uh, if, if I have... Uh, yes, here we go. Um, and, uh, Hello, everyone. So now I'll share my screen and then that's how we'll do it. All right. There you go. Can you can you see this? Yes. Yes. Hello everyone. Hello everyone. To the editor Sukhita Kumar and Thank you very much for the invitation. 
When you commit, uh, as Shobhna said, when you commit memory to paper, it beautiful, it beautiful. fabulous, yeah. uh, fabulous ending. Uh, Vinita, yeah, if you have the yearbook uh, paper copy with you, would you would you care to show us what the cover looks like? So that so this... I can do that. I am not carrying. I am not in Delhi right now, sir. Right. Yeah, and you are. Uh, it's a fabulous looking cover, yearbook. Very elegant, very simple. Yes. And so, Krita, may I request you that since Sony's video was a little, audio was a little garbled, yes. uh, we should be, you know, maybe you would like to read out his poem. Yeah, I think so. I, this before, is what I was also going to suggest. Yeah, before I play Arjun's, uh, Arjun's video. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just get it. Shadow plays what we read, right? No, 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 no. The day communism died. Oh, we couldn't even make out what poem we read. You know? yeah. So it's, right. it happens sometimes with these... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, technology. Uh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. Let's read it. Let's yes. read it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So this, here, here I go. This is Sony Somarajan. Uh, the day communism died. Let words distance themselves like my widowed grandmother, where the simplest of cotton eat the thinnest air and depend on money orders. The family and anyone who counted discuss the eyes and nays of a cremation as grandfather's body lay beside a flickering lamb, never lit while he was alive. Filled to its seams, the room holds its breath, unable to mourn the one who built it. The periods of hush broken often by a sudden wail, sometimes a staccato. In death, this free for all manifests a betrayal of the departed. The comrades' faith, preserved carefully once, now undone, the public washes away the private, rendering everything pointless. Stunning boy. Stunning. Beautiful. Really Absolutely. Beautiful. Absolutely. And such serenity, you know, there is a kind of pathos and serenity out there, which is kept so well. Absolutely. And, and one thing that I, I did notice, or, or if, if I have noticed it correctly, not just from these recordings, is that so many of the poems are pithy. They're very short very pithy. and they pack a punch despite that. So uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, which is... Uh, which to me is very, very impressive. It's very hard to say so much in so few words. Absolutely. And, and, uh, and the yearbook reflects that. Uh, 
So, so in fact, the third video we are playing uh, is also, I think, a short poem. This one is by Arjun Rajendra. Um, let me just uh, very quickly um, cue the video. Um, here we go. Can you see this? Yes. 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 Here we go. Hello, uh, my name is Arjun Rajendran and I'm going to be reading a poem for your book of the for three hours. Koja Tari is walking, Nagra of Sunday Bible. Under the truth, those in the sheer law of Kinsoyal King Dry and British. But the Armenian doesn't distinguish them from the enemy. Building the mine along the correct site of the North Burn Bridge. Why worry about the flag of the ship? As long as it will carry the task for burial in Joseph. If owing to this, he will never confess. Real thoughts to the guest. Two soldiers should hold St. George like a native Thank you. That, that video was. Um... Under a minute. So, the yeah, prettiest poem we have this <laughs> evening so far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, were you able to follow his audio? Was it uh, really? Not particularly because of the background mm -hmm. noise. Yes. Um, yes. Would, would, it, would you like to uh, perhaps? Yeah, I think I will read out the poem because it was the audio was, didn't seem very good to me. No. So, Arjun read out this poem. It's titled Koja Petrus Uskan. Madras, 1746. Under his roof, though the monsieur knows, Uskin's loyalties lie with the British, but the Armenian doesn't distinguish him from his enemy. Building the Marmalong has perhaps taught him not to burn bridges. Why worry about the flag of the ship as long as it will carry his heart? for burial in Julfa. It's owing to this he will never confess his real thoughts to his guest, whose soldiers strip Fort St. George like a native mistress. Lovely. That's a wonderful, Fabulous. wonderful like, exposition of a piece of history. Yes. Can I suggest that we can have Shobna's poem also read up? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yes. I wasn't very happy with the recording. The audio of that too. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> you to read it out, uh, Vinita, or would you like to read it? Please any, go any, ahead. Which one? Please which go was ahead. The... It was tight. It's she has one poem in the yearbook. It's titled yeah, yeah. uh, An Amnesia of Words. Yes, an amnesia of words. So I, I did catch on towards the middle onwards, but in the beginning, I think there was a problem. Anyway, let's do it, right? Yes. So, uh, an amnesia of words. She has never been good at writing recipes down. We taunt her, believing she refuses to diverge a secret ingredient and sets an impossible bar for the rest of us. Watch, she says and begins to weave her charm, taking pinches full of spice and handfuls of others. Of course, we lose track, but we are eager to make a book of her signatures. Posterity is on our minds. She flounders each time we ask for measurements. The book is a disaster. She dies, leaving us with the eternal aftertaste of mistaken proportions. We are reminded of her wisdom. When you commit memory to paper, it disappears. Wow. Beautiful. Very beautiful. Beautiful. Stunning last line. Yes, absolutely. That's exquisite. Yeah. So, I mean, another thing is that, uh, you know, uh, apart from Arjun's poem, uh, these did uh, these poems did seem to have narrators who were in a sense memoir writing their poetic yes. memoirs who were uh, yes. uh, writing from their life histories from their autobiographies uh, which is uh, which is which is very very interesting poetry to read since one can read uh, so yeah. much into it um, yes uh, but even so, 
even Arjun's poem. Yes, you know, yes. It's from history. Yes. But there has to be an owning of that history, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. It has to, it becomes your personal history in one sense, how you relate to it, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, who, uh, so, so if we were to continue a few, with a few questions about the yearbook yes. before we yes. before we go on to reading more poems, um, how, how many did you finally include? How many poems? Hundred and seven poems made it to the yearbook, out of which uh, about twelve poets had two poems in the yearbook. The others all have one. And I forgot to also mention this in the when we were talking about the selection process. You know, one very tedious task to do was to verify whether the publication that was mentioned by the poet right. did actually happen in the correct at the correct. You know, whatever dates were given to us. Yes. Did it happen? So we found there were two uh, <coughs> discrepancies me. there, and unfortunately, those poems had to be disqualified because they were not published in that year. They were published right. in about four years earlier. Mm -hmm. So that was a bit of a tedious thing. Um, but 107 poems, yes, made it to the book. Wonderful, wonderful. And uh, uh, so so would you like to, uh, would you like to- No, uh, so it's, so it's, so it's, no, I'm sorry, I have to correct myself. Of course, of course. 127 poems are in the yearbook, I think, and 107 poets. Ah, yes. Yes, yes, sorry. yes. I'm so never good at figures, yeah. but I knew there was some problem. <laughs> There's something wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, one one thing that that I noticed uh, about particularly about shall we say the period of say 2022 date is that by the standards usual uh, standards of Indian poetry in English there there are a large there is a large number of anthologies coming out. Apart from yes. the book, we had uh, the one called, uh, I think, Singing in the Dark, mm. uh, which was uh, which was specifically about the pandemic. Yes. Uh, Jit Thail's uh, anthology is coming out, yeah. Yeah. which, yes. which of course, was by invitation only. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. And there are a few more in the works, apparently. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you think that, you know, may, maybe we can just as ascribe it to pure chance, but uh, what do you think is the uh, anthologizing trend? Is there even one or is it just chance? These things just happen. Some I, ideas I, just I gain currency. It, I don't think it's just chance. Huh. But already I have no real answer to that. I have also been wondering why has this, the, why has the culture of the anthology suddenly emerged in a big way? Um, I think maybe it's about, you know, people being confined to their soul, you know, in solitude to their little cells of you know one room wherever they are living and writing and existing. So there's this desire to somehow network amongst uh, poets. Perhaps subconsciously we may ascribe it to that. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And also there is to extend this point. I think there's sense of camaraderie in a way, you know. And uh, also by way of selection, you're also making a statement, an anthology also makes a statement on the aesthetic that may have. So if it's a single person doing it, it's that person's aesthetics that is at work, right? So, so then you also wonder why some poems are left out or poets are left out and why others are left. And are there politics to it? I'm talking about healthy politics of aesthetics. I'm not talk, maligning uh, the thing. But the point is that, yes, it's a healthy trend because if, if that happens in that fashion, the only unfortunate thing is that we don't have a very good review culture. You know, if we were to have a good review culture, in fact, uh, we were hoping, uh, and I hope some reviews are you know, forthcoming in as far as yearbook is concerned, mm -hmm. because Anita and I have gone out of the way to work around it as to who should review and how should we get it reviewed. But we don't have that culture in this country where people would pick up the book and uh, you know, review it, or tear it to pieces or uh, whatever, whatever. But the critical consciousness that is required to look at a, an anthology and to comment on the selection from the point of view of the aesthetics, if that were to happen, I think it will be a very, very learning process. 
and anthologies, if they are happening, then each anthology, anthology is going to represent a particular point of view in aesthetic. And if that is going to happen, then I think there will be a culture, critical culture that also goes alongside by side. You notice that there are many poets today who are also academics, you know, they are into academics. But why is there not this stepping back a little bit and writing on poetry rather than writing poetry only, right? Yeah. So poetry writing, <laughs> I'm not saying that immediately you comment, but particularly when books happen, mm. there is a need, like you have the tea testers, you know, you need to have tasting of that uh, book as to what, how does it taste? What do you inform the public? Yeah. So uh, that is a lag, I think. And in fact, and also, so his, I was also thinking now, just as Suprita was speaking, that an anthology speaks to its times. So when you have singing in the dark, then it's clearly an attempt to archive pandemic poetry. When you speak of open your eyes, it's clearly an attempt to bring out and you know talk about climate change issues. Which is pretty much pretty and that, was, that was the anthology that you edited, Vinita, also with yeah. Havakar. That's correct. So I think that the theme-based content of anthologies is also a very significant factor in having, uh, having these anthologies emerge. Fantastic. Um, so now we, uh, you know, we, uh, we might, uh, if you like, we could read a few more poems. Sure. That would um, be wonderful. So I, do you have a favorite? I mean, that would be a good idea, you know, to have you also give us your favorite one. <laughs> one. You know? um, I, I, I actually, uh, you know, I would, uh, I would be hard pressed to say that, but I would be, I would be very, very interested if, see, you had seven, eight events, right? So I'd be really, really uh, keen to hear stuff here that maybe you haven't read elsewhere. Or that you've read yes. seldom, seldom read elsewhere. No, no, we will definitely not read poems that have been read before. It's only fair to the contributors that as many of them get featured on uh, various platforms, you know. So, yes. so maybe I would like to read Trivarna Hariharan's poem. It resonated with me, a poem titled Hunger. It's a very exquisitely crafted poem. Just give me one minute, please. I was going to say Irshad. Irshad, bilkul. <laughs> Just trust. All right, so here I am. Oh, I'm still not there. Sorry about this. I'm scrolling actually. All right. Okay, I have it here now. <clears throat> it's titled Hunger by Trivarna Hariharan. At 2 p.m. sharp, Mama signals us for lunch. Her voice scatters around the room like newly ground pepper. From a large silver bowl, she scoops rice onto our sun-soaked plates her palm rests on the bowl's burnt brown bottom. Going round a circle, going around a circle, she journeys from the spoon to the plate to the bowl. I shudder to think the word serve. Again and again and again. Throughout the day, she circles the same loop, unloading the vessels from the stove, setting them on a table, serving, collecting, washing. Somewhere in between, a cry escapes from her mouth, like an unborn child, quiet, 
and unquestioning. After we have finished, she drops on a wooden chair to eat, swallows the day's remains like a cat licking a half-thrown bowl of milk. Not knowing what to offer her, I watch on like a stranger. Mm. Beautiful. Very beautiful. I love the way the self-consciousness that comes in of witnessing what's going on. Yes, yes, it's, it's a very Indian ethos kind of a poem. Yeah. Very yeah. authentic Indian poem. Yeah. yeah. What would you like to read, Sukrita? Yeah, so I'm thinking, you know, I mean, there are so many that I like. The problem, the problem to choose. But yes, we are not going to read people who've already been featured. So I like to read uh, Aspen's, um, Aspen's, Aspen's, Aspen's Garden. You know, it's a short poem, which I love. Yeah. Who's it by? Aswin Vijayan. Aswin Vijayan, yes. Okay. Garden. I live here. When you come to visit, you bring the garden with you. And the snake is an albino, orange, slithering over your untouched skin. We sit sipping cider and talking about sex toys. What we are denied, we crave. I see the brown eye slits peeking from between the wefts of your peach soft woolen sweats. The body of a happy hip on the table between us and its head in my mouth. Well, wow. a very beautiful poem. Absolutely fabulous. And again, so short. Very short, yes. yes. Shall I read Satyajit Sarna's poem? Yes, please. Uh, go ahead. It's, uh, it's titled Rain Things. And this was a nomination from Sampurna Chatterjee. It was published in Indian Quarterly. It has an epigraph by Aga Shahid Ali. It goes like this. Rain Things. It rains as I write this. Mad heart, be brave. Aga Shahidan. I used to think they didn't matter. The little things that people did. But now I think they might. It rains as I write this. Mad heart, be brave. We might not have elections next year and the harvest could fail. The newspaper could be blank in the morning and the passport lines full. The kids could go to school for the last time and the buses might stop running. So if it starts to rain, creeping up your street, you should do the, th you should do the rain things. Go ahead, put sugar in your tea and go to the corner for a Buddha. Let those grits stick in your teeth and worry them with your tongue. Close your eyes, feel your caged heart beat like a bird in the hand. Bring the rain things home for your family. Watch the pakodas drain into the paper. Yesterday's world is turning translucent. Open the windows and never mind the windowsill. Bigger things than rain are trying to wash your world away. Lovely. Oh, lovely. <laughs> Absolutely, and so political without being yes. without yes. being sloganeering. So it's a good poem, and it's a good political poem. And, very well said. And that is so rare. Absolutely. It's it's very hard to do, and it's so rare. Yes, yes. Uh, and it's uh, uh, and as uh, I, I I remember uh, recently interviewing Mustansir Dalvi uh, mm -hmm. for the uh, you know for money control for his quadrilingual uh, uh, version of his chapbook on the. Uh, you know, the work of crisis, which led to people walking across hundreds, hundreds of kilometers. And that is the point that came through when his uh, co-translators, Hemant, uh, uh, Hemant, uh, excuse Hemant. me, Hemant Thakkar and uh, Hemant Divte <laughs> said that, 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 that this meets the standards of good poetry and its uh, content is political, which yeah, this yeah. poem does so remarkably. Very true. And very accessibly with, while at the same time being such good poet, poetry. Yeah. Exactly. Actually, 
That's uh, that's what I felt even about Chandramon's uh, poet, Chandramon. Yes. Uh, Satyanathan. Okay. Chandramon, Chandramon as, yes. you know. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. When he's sort of, uh, he's writing on caste and he says on intercaste love. Shall I read that? Please, please do, please do, please do. He says, just like the saying goes, tongue has no bones but can break many. The submissive tuft of fear on the shaven heads of the twice born command an army of henchmen guarding the rust of medieval fence built along cast hymens. Two love poems from two different languages elope on a moonless night, storming the Bastille of apparently impregnable fortresses of their syntax. Look how oh, so, oh, oh. so beautiful, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. So, again, it could have become, you know, a kind of, you know, vulgarly um, political in the context of caste and so on, but it's a perfect poem. It's so aesthetic. You know, yes, yes, yes. The subtlety, the ambiguity, the complexity is maintained. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Do we have time for one more short poem? We we certainly do. Thank you. So this is a poem a poem by Pramila Venkateshwaran. She's yes. a diaspora poet from the USA. This one is titled "Credo of the Literalist." Credo of the Literalist. Termites eat a whole house. A bug brings down an oak. One person ousts a government. A microbe upends a world. We learn to stay alone. The hours of a day fill up with sleep. Cooking and eating rise into arts. We write and rewrite dreams. My email announces my friend's death. My keening floods the yard. We lose audiences. No need to juggle priorities. Sisyphus is frozen. The cross means canceled. It's very powerful last night. Absolutely. And, uh, very powerful. and such a slant way of looking at the pandemic and indeed. other stuff around it. Yes, yes indeed. Uh, absolutely fabulous. And uh, uh, so uh, just before we end this program, uh, would you like to tell us where the book is, can, is available? Is it uh, online on Havakal's website? Is it on Amazon or both? Yes, it's available at both places. Oh. On Amazon as well as uh, Havakal's website, and we urge the viewers, whoever's watching this and going to watch this in the future, to grab a copy because it's it's the one place stop to read good quality anglophone poetry being written in India. And uh, and before we uh, close the program, uh, do you plan to make this an annual feature? Yes, of course. That's the whole purpose <laughs> of the year. Yeah, we have to carry the cross through. <laughs> and uh, cross doesn't mean cancel here. <laughs> Basically, we are carrying the cross for our own redemption, as it were. <laughs> Absolutely, and uh, may we all benefit from it, as such exercises generally do. Uh, Vinita and Sukrita, thank you so much for giving us your time. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much, Ben and Prithvi. Thank, thank you so much, Sohit. It's been an absolute pleasure. So, I hope. Uh, so, guys, please catch this video on YouTube on our official channel, which is Penet to Three Webcast. We will also be linking it in our uh, Instagram account and Twitter account. So, until next time, goodbye.